This next session is on the next generation of space exploration. Your moderator is a man festooned with distinctions. Best-selling author, Emmy winner, White House and international news correspondent. Please welcome John Donvan. Thank you. Um, good evening. Good, good afternoon. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to stand for the first few minutes of this presentation for reasons that will become obvious shortly. Um, but on my stroll over here, I was thinking how wonderful it could be if all of us, just before we begin, could very quickly run outside. I'm not asking you to do that. But very quickly run outside and look up into the sky, which turned into a beautiful, beautiful crystal blue today, and, and have a moment in which we could all dream and imagine and envision what's up there and how far that goes. And to take note of the fact that when most of us in the room were born, we hadn't gone very far. And if you look up into that sky today when we're imagining, we're imagining with the knowledge that there's a lot of pieces of hardware up there. They're there right now on beyond the moon landing. We have a microscope on Mars. We've had space stations. We have humans circling the orbit, circling the Earth all of the time. And just how astounding and fascinating that is. And yet somehow, if you ask me, it's often out of mind. We're not aware of just what's going on, how deeply we've penetrated uh, into our own solar system, what we're learning, and what is yet to come. And that is going to be the topic of our conversation, because we have, as our next speaker, a most fascinating man who until 49 days ago was the head of NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab, a position he held for 45 years until he stepped down. He has seen it all. He was there when the rockets were going up and going down too fast. And he was there when they began to lead to success. And he was there as the plans were laid for the next generation of space exploration. So let's please welcome to the stage for a fascinating conversation on what's ahead, what worlds await us. Please welcome Charles Alachi. And Charles, the reason, the reason I'm standing, and I think it was mentioned that I was a correspondent for many years with ABC Nightline, and the greatest compliment Ted Koppel ever paid me, one day he called me in and he said, you know, Donvan, you know what makes you a really good interviewer? You know when to shut up <laughs> and disappear. Charles has a presentation he's going to make. It'll last about 20 minutes or so. So for that reason, I am going to shut up and disappear and give the floor to Charles and I'll be back. Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Alachi. Thank you, John, for that nice introduction. Uh, you know, 58 years ago, uh, Caltech Jet Propulsion Lab launched the first American satellite called Explorer 1 in response to the Sputnik, you know, launch. And at that time, people, I was not there at that time. I'm a little bit younger than that. Uh, at that time, it was amazing that even we were able to put a satellite in orbit, you know, or a small satellite in orbit. Fast forward to today, we have visited every planet in our solar system. We have had rovers on Mars for at least a decade. We have really looked all the way back to almost the origin of the universe, just after God turned the switch on and created the Big Bang. So it is amazing when you think about it what has been accomplished just during a lifetime. So what I'm going to do today is basically, first I'm going to start by giving you a quick introduction about the history of the solar system, uh, or in actuality, the history of the universe. And if you pay careful attention, uh, it's good enough that you can impress your friends, you know, when you go back home. So it is somewhat simplified. So let me start by kind of describing you how do we believe the universe was created. Almost about a little more than 13 billion years ago, there was a big bang. Now, don't ask me how did it happen or what was before the big bang. We only know what's after the big bang. And during that big bang, a lot of particles were created. And somehow, these particles got together and they formed stars and galaxies. And these are examples of some of these galaxies. And there are literally billions and billions of those galaxies. And some of them are still forming. Some of the stars are still forming. 
and some of the stars are dying. So we really have still a dynamic universe. And if you zoom on one of these galaxies, so that's what it looks like, and each galaxy literally has billions and billions of stars in it. So remember, billions of galaxies, each one of them has billions of stars. And somehow around one of those stars, the particle got together and they formed the planets, what we call our solar system. And you know, we are on that little blue dot, third from the left here. And somehow on that planet, there was the right environment, the right temperature, the right ingredient, that somehow cells were formed and replicated. And after 3.8 billion years of evolution, we got this beautiful world that we live in. Isn't that amazing? How did it start from that Big Bang? And then here we are, you and I sitting down, having a conversation. And to make it even more amazing, after the 3.8 billion years of evolution, we got Donna and Ron, <laughs> or Don Rosa. Now, you didn't realize it took 3.8 billion years ago to get this great specimen of two people here. But to make you feel better, it took that long for all of us you know, to get through that evolution. So what is amazing to us is how did we start and how did we get here? So what we're trying to do in our exploration research, space exploration, is to do what I call write the book of how did it start, how did the galaxies form, how did the star form, how did the planet form, how did life evolve, and is this something common? Is there life everywhere around the universe? Are there other Kent presents, you know, somewhere else in the universe? And that would be amazing. Or are we unique? Is this the only place where life evolved? That would be equally amazing. So what I'm hoping to do today is to kind of describe to you only a couple of small chapters of that book based on what we have learned in the last you know, couple of decades and also to give you a little bit of an insight or sneak preview of what we think we're going to be doing over the next couple of decades. So the first chapter I'm going to talk about is Mars. Now, Mars is particularly interesting and gets a lot of attention. It's one of the two closest planets to us, so the other one is Venus. It has a lot of similarity to our planets as well as differences. If you look at Mars on the right, it has polar caps, you know, at the bottom, and it changes from the south to the north. A year on Mars is two years on Earth. A day on Mars is one day on Earth plus 20 minutes. It has an atmosphere much thinner than our atmosphere, but it has an atmosphere. But also it has differences. If you look at the land mass on Mars, it's the same as the land mass on Earth, if I take the oceans you know, away. But let me show you some similarities. One side of that picture is a canyon on Mars, the other one is the Grand Canyon. I'll let you guess which one you know is which, because that illustrates to you the similarity between the two. And now that you guess, the one on the left is the Grand Canyon, the one on the right is, is the Grand Canyon on Mars. We have volcanoes on Earth, there are volcanoes on Mars also. On the left is a cinder cone in California, on the right is Mount Olympus on Mars. That mountain, which is created volcanically, as you see in the caldera at the top, is higher than Mount Everest. So clearly, sometime in the past when it was forming, there was a lot of volcanic activity and heat going on on that planet. Today, it's extinct. So somehow, something changed, and now things are extinct on Mars. That's a test I give to my students at Caltech. I tell them, guess which one is Mars and which one is Earth? You know, or in actuality, it's Death Valley. Now, to be honest with you, I almost forgot which one is which. <laughs> the only hint, if you paid careful attention, on the one on the right, there was a snake, you know, going by. That's the only way I can remember that this is Earth or this is Death Valley. So when we send astronauts to land on Mars, she's going to think she's in Death Valley. It will be so familiar, you know, to us. It's not any different. The point I'm making is that geologic processes which are occurring on Mars are basically identical to what's happening here on Earth. 
But in fact, when we look at Mars now, we even see flows of liquid which are coming on the side of these craters. To make a long story short, what we believe is a few billion years ago when Earth was formed and Mars was formed, they formed roughly at the same time. There was actually liquid oceans on Mars. There were rivers. And somehow the climate on Mars changed and became much colder. And that water either partially disappeared or mostly went below the surface and is frozen. And during the summer, as the sunlight shines on the side of these craters, some of that ice actually melts and flows down. So the immediate question is, if there were water on Mars, same time on Earth, could have life evolved? And if it did, how far did it evolve you know, in its evolution? So that's what we're trying to find out by exploring that planet. So let me tell you now about the challenge you know, to get to Mars. First, you know, when we launched Curiosity a few years ago, after 25 million kilometers of travel, we had to land within a two-kilometer circle. Now, just to give you an idea what that means, that means if you go outside and hit the golf ball towards St. Andrews, the ball has to go straight in the cup. <laughs> That's how accurate it has to be. And for the good golfers here, to make it even more challenging, the cup is moving because Mars is moving. And we still have to get it in the cup. So that's one little challenge for the engineers at JPL. Another challenge, as we are coming to enter the atmosphere on Mars, the energy in that capsule is the equivalent of 18,000 race cars going at full speed. And somehow we have to slow down and land softly on the surface so we can survive that landing. So we came up. Even when you get close to the surface, you still have to touch very softly with all your electronics. So we came with two techniques. One technique, which we used about 10 years ago, where after we opened the parachute, slowed us down, fired the retro rocket, we inflated the airbags and let the rover bounce on the surface. And once it stopped, we deflated it, and the rover came out. People thought we are crazy when we thought about that. But that's what makes it interesting. When we landed Curiosity a few years ago, we did something a little different because it was too big. It was the size of your car. So we couldn't actually put airbags. So what we did, we came and hovered and sky craned down the rover from a hovering spacecraft. That's on another planet that we are doing that. Now, when we first went and told NASA headquarters how we're planning to land it, their reaction you guys are out of your mind. You must be smoking something in California that nobody else smokes. But in actuality, it was based on fairly careful thinking and fairly careful math that we thought that that was the best way you know, to land it. So today, as we speak, we actually have two rovers on Mars. Not many of you, as John was mentioning, would realize that our nation have had rovers on Mars for more than a decade, continuously. Day in, day out, we have been driving those rovers, exploring the surface of Mars. That's the one on your left. The one on your right, we just celebrated the fourth anniversary. So what you are going to see next is actually what happened when you land things on Mars. Things are looking good. Coming up on the tree. The able to report entry interface. At this time, it'll begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, they'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guided start, start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle is just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth T's. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We 
are decelerating. Seachill sep has separated, we've found the ground. Phantom. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for batch separation. We are in powered flight. <laughs> We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane has started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. Today, right now, the wheels of curiosity have begun to blaze the trail for human footprints on Mars. This is an amazing achievement. Well, today on Mars, history was made on Earth. The successful landing of curiosity marks what is really an unprecedented technological tour de force. It will stand as an American point of pride far into the future. Well, tonight was, was a great drama that was played. I could only think of the words of Teddy Roosevelt as I was sitting there. It is far better to dare mighty things even though we might fail than to stay in the twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Okay, needless to say, this was a very exciting and tense you know, evening, every time I watch this video, my heartbeat goes up, even I've seen it thousands of times. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the evening of the landing, we had 50 million Americans actually on our website watching it in real time. Now, when I go to Washington, I tell them 50 million voters were watching it. That gets their attention. Right? The following day, we had 1.6 billion hits worldwide on our website. That was four years ago. To do that. And that shows a broad you know, interest and excitement. Now, kind of referring a little bit to the previous talk about Americans' role, uh, clearly it was exciting, the landing, and I was very proud of it. But for me, the best moment was just after the landing, uh, I had as guests the head of the French Space Agency and the deputy head of the Russian Space Agency. They came to see me to congratulate me. They looked at me and said, only the United States can do this. And that was a great pride, you know, for me. So now let me tell you what, uh, what we have learned from this mission and what we are planning to do. So clearly this is opportunities, one which have been there for 12 years. So it keep on going and going and going. It was supposed to work for three months and 12 years later it's still exploring, you know, the surface. And what we have found out, if you are a geologist and you look at this picture, this looks like a dry lake bed. It looks like many places in Owens Valley, if you are familiar with California, where actually the water has evaporated or went down below the surface, and it leaves some crust you know, of salt you know, on the surface. So that was one indication that actually water existed you know, on Mars in the past. But more direct, 
is we actually, the rover has like a miniaturized chemistry lab like you have in any advanced university. It has x-ray machine like your dentist has that take x-ray pictures, except it's much more expensive. Uh, we have what we call gamma ray machine, mass spectrometers, ovens, all being run robotically because it takes 20 minutes for the signal to get to Mars and come back. So you cannot joystick it. So the rover has to be smart enough to be, we tell it in general what we want it to do, and it actually conduct these. So we have drilled a number of holes, pulled out samples, put them in the oven, heated them, looked at what chemical came out, did some x-ray, and the bottom line that every element in your body actually exists on Mars. You know, the carbon, the hydrogen, the phosphorus, all of them exist on Mars. And clearly there was water on Mars in the past, so it immediately begs the question, could have life evolved? We have not detected life yet. Uh, we have detected organic material, or if you want, sea, sea molecules or carbon chain molecules, but not yet, I have not detected life yet. And you see scenes like this one. It could be anywhere, you know, in the desert, and we are doing studies of the different rocks here. And this is where we were. The red line is where we were, and the blue is where we're heading. And as you can see, we are going to be climbing up a hill. And for the geologist, this is like heaven. Because you look at these rocks, and you see layers you know, in them along that mountain. So we are going to drive up those layers. Because you could imagine, you don't have to be an expert in geology, the bottom layer most likely is older than the one above it, which is older than the one above it, and so on. So as we drive up and sample all these layers, we are going back in history and learning about how Mars actually evolved and be able to write a chapter about the evolution of that planet and who knows you know, what we will actually will discover as we go through those layers. So that's exactly what anthropologists go and do when they go and look in dry area about human you know, history. They look in those old layers along you know, cliffs or mountains. Now, the next step, we're planning to send another rover in 2020. The rover itself is about the same, but this one will have different instruments because what we want to do is to actually take samples, put them in one location, so later we can go and land, go grab those samples, put them in the nose of a little rocket that we take with us, launch those samples into orbit, put them in orbit, send another spacecraft, to rendezvous with them and bring the samples back so we can analyze them on Earth. Piece of cake, yes, no problem to do that. So that's what will happen in the next decade. Now we're adding a little twist to this one. We're actually adding a little helicopter which will be flying and the reason is, other than the pizzazz of it, but actually on a rover you can only see about 100 yards ahead of you. So you can only plan about 100, a drive of about 100 yards. With the helicopter, you can fly and survey the area in front of you and take self-pictures also. But that will allow you to plan many kilometers and therefore be able to explore much more efficiently. Now, the technical people here will immediately say, are you kidding us? The pressure on Mars is 1% of the pressure on Earth. How can you fly a helicopter? You know, 1% that's higher than when you take a transcontinental jet. So it's like flying a helicopter which flies much higher than a 777. Never have happened. But that's the kind of challenge we like. You know, the more challenging things are, that's what makes the young people, you know, be excited. So we actually have built one. It's only about two pounds in size, in weight. Put it in a vacuum chamber at JPL, simulated the Mars environment, and actually made it fly to do that. So four years from now, you'll actually will be seeing drones actually flying on Mars. Now this is what looks like those samples that we are going to collect. So again, remember as I mentioned to you earlier, everything has to be done robotically. So that requires not just going taking your drill from your garage and going and do your drilling. And you are drilling through rocks and all of it has to be done by this autonomous rover. So we have to do a lot of tests. And the other advance we are doing, as you know now, many of you probably experience some virtual reality you put some glasses, and then it can look a scene which is transpose you somewhere. So now what we do, scientists around the world get on WebEx or on their computer and communicate 
to decide where to drive the rover. What we are going to do in four years, every scientist will have classes. You can have it at home. And actually, you'll transpose you to Mars. You'll be as if we are standing next to the rover. You walk with the rover as it drives. And you say, gee, I like this rock. I'd like to drill in it. Command goes straight to the rover. I mean, you have to have a password you know, to do that. <laughs> Command will go up to the rover, and actually, the rover gets the samples. So it's going to be a different experience of how actually we explore. You can all participate in real time in our actual exploration. And then ultimately, who knows, we might actually lead to stations you know, on Mars in the next 20, 30, or 40 years where you have rovers, airplane balloons really exploring like we actually explore on our own planet. So that's the first chapter. Now let me brief you about another chapter that we are working on now, and that's what we call other ocean worlds. Up to recently, we thought liquid ocean today exists only on Earth. Well, we found out that there are many satellites of outer solar system which actually have oceans you know, on them. And again, as we say oceans, that means liquid water. That means the temperature is right. And the next question, could life be on them today? Not in the past, but today, because the ocean is still, still there. So let me give you a couple of examples. This is a picture of Jupiter with the four Galilean satellite, of course, discovered by Galileo, so it's called the Galilean satellite. That was a few hundred years ago. This is Jupiter today with our spacecraft where we took pictures of those satellites. You can see the relative size. You see two satellites in front of Jupiter. But there is one which is particularly interesting, and that's Europa. It's a satellite roughly bigger than our moon. But when you look at the surface, it looks like it's made of ice. Matter of fact, this reminds me when I fly to Europe and you look out of the window over the North Pole, you look like this floating ice, which is floating. And that's what we think actually is on Europa. We know it's made of ice. We know that brown stuff is some kind of organic material. And the ice is moving or floating. So the question is, how deep is that ocean below it? And can we get to that ocean? So what we believe today, based on our models and some of the results, is just a few miles below the surface. We don't know exactly how thick that ice. Actually, there is an ocean. And the water in that ocean is more than the water in the ocean on Earth. As you can see, roughly our estimate for it. So clearly, it's a very liquid you know, object. Now, immediately, somebody will say, well, how could it be we are so far away from the sun? How could you have liquid water? The water should be frozen. It's so cold. And that is true. It's frozen. But as Europa goes around Jupiter, there are tides, exactly like what happened with the moon and have the tides on Earth. So after a few million years of tides pumping back and forth, it melts that ice. It's like you take a piece of metal, and if you keep bending it, it warms up. So what happened here, even when we are away from the sun, that the tides actually keep pumping that ice and create that ocean. So now what we are doing, we are planning a mission, which we are first going to go in orbit. We are going to sound that ice. And this will be done early next decade. We are going to sound that ice to see how thick it is. And hopefully, if we find a relatively thin area, we want to land and actually melt our way and get a submarine to get in that ocean. And we are starting to basically develop that technology. And that's what you see here. This is not on Europa. This is up in the Arctic. We actually built an upside down rover where you drill a hole. You pull that rover down. The rover floats up and drive on the ice on the bottom part you know, of the ice. So that's our way how we're going to explore basically the oceans of Europa. And you can put the kind of instrument that you need to detect you know, for life on that planet, I mean, on that satellite. Now, there is another satellite which is equally exciting, and that's Enceladus. Enceladus is a satellite of Saturn. It's smaller than our moon. It's made of ice. But what we were amazed, we saw fractures in that ice. So as we were flying by it, we looked backward. And look what we saw at the bottom of that picture. We saw geysers, like you see in Yellowstone, which are shooting out you know, of that satellite. And to give you an idea of the scale, those 
geysers or those plumes are about 50 kilometers in height. Imagine you are standing next to Yellowstone and it's shooting much higher than an airplane would be flying, you know, over a yacht or passenger airplane. And that's the same reason. We think there is an ocean below the surface which resulting from the tidal pumping that Saturn, you know, creates on that little satellite. Because remember, Saturn and Jupiter are hundreds of times bigger than Earth. So they have a massive mass and they really pump these satellites. And that creates this ocean. So now, being you know, gutsy a little bit at JPL, mm. we have a spacecraft called Cassini, which is in orbit around Saturn. We directed it to actually fly through those plumes and collect samples. And guess what we found? We found H2O, hydrocarbon, all the things that you find which could generate life on another world. So that's the next major activity that, uh, that we are conducting over the next decade. And then the third one is Titan. Titan is a satellite of Jupiter, uh, sorry, satellite of Saturn, which is bigger than our moon. It has clouds. And what we found out that it trains on Titan. There are rivers, there are lakes. It evaporates, goes in the atmosphere. So it's similar to what happened on Earth, except it's all made of hydrocarbon. So it's not water which rains. You're actually raining gasoline you know, on the Mars. So usually, kiddingly, I tell people, if you are living on Titan and you need to fill your car, you just go to the nearest lake and you start you know, filling up your tank. On the other hand, if you light a cigarette, the whole planet will blow up <laughs> in one bit. But again, the interesting part here is, here it's an organic ocean. Could life evolve in that, in a hydrocarbon ocean? Not an H2O ocean, but a hydrocarbon ocean. And would that life be similar or would that be different? So we are in the process of planning a mission where actually we'll, plan, we'll land boats or airplanes or, or balloons to go and explore that satellite. Now, let me finish with the third chapter, which are just starting to write. And where is John? John, you can. That's my last slide. Now, for, for thousands of years, people looked at the star and wondered if there are planets around them, like planets here you know, on Earth. Well, recently we launched a telescope called Kepler, that was about two years ago, where what we did, we looked at a small part of the sky, and we looked like 10,000 stars, and measured the brightness of those stars very, very carefully. And we found that on almost all of them, every once in a while there is a dip, which happened in the light. And then the dip happened again, and then it happened again in a periodic, periodic way. That means there is an object which is coming and going around it. And the dip is when that object comes in front of it and blocks a little bit of the light. So by measuring the period, we can tell what's the orbital period of that planet. And by measuring the dip, we can tell you how big the planet is. Because the bigger it is, it blocks, blocks more of that planet. And what we found out, literally, thousands and thousands of planets exist around neighboring stars. So clearly, planetary systems are common. Now, the next step we want to do is to do what we call a coronagraph, where you launch a telescope, you put a dark dot in the center of the lens, so you can block the light from the star, like I barely can see you, but if I block this, now I can see you much better. So by blocking the light from the star, then we can take pictures of those planets. And who knows? you know, we might find a planet similar to our own planet. And the picture you see in there, that was the artistic side of JPL. We have a group of artists where they sit down and start to imagine if we discover a planet similar to Earth and want to do a travel bureau, what would the poster <laughs> looks like? And that's what you see in there. I'm going to touch only on one of them, one which is to the left in there. And there is some logic behind these posters. On that one, it's a planet which is around what we call a warm star. That means it emits light mostly in the red, instead of the red, blue, green that our sun emits. So if you are standing there next to a fence, you will say, instead of saying the grass is green on the other side of the fence, you say the grass is red on the other side of the fence, because most likely the color will be red. So this gives you a little bit of flavor about the kind of things 
that we do, and there's a mighty thanks that we do at JPL and Caltech. Thank you very much. Charles, we have just a few minutes to chat. Um, I just have to ask this as a, a hard-nosed journalist. You, you put up. That's why I keep on going. I'm just cutting some water. You put up that photograph side by side of a scene, flat black and white scene from Mars and a black and white flat scene from somewhere in the US. And you said you saw a snake there. But you said you weren't sure which was which. I just want to ask you, are you sure that you did not discover a snake on Mars? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I'm almost sure yeah. <laughs> on that one. Because but I leave that it's a, a it test. would be a very big thing. I will do that as a test for the students. <laughs> um, I, I like to take some of these conversations in a somewhat more biographical direction because all of this work is done by people, real people. You're one of them. I think it's fair to say that really you are a national treasure. Well, you, you have been. Thank you. Um, so, so what's your story? Where were you born? And, and then what happened? Well, I was born in Lebanon in a little village. Had no idea that, I mean, I was fascinated with space, but no idea that I will end, you know, where I ended. Uh, then I was fortunate as when I finished high school, I got a fellowship to study wherever I want. So I went to France because I was going through French schools. Some of you might have been to Grenoble in southern France in the Alp Mountains. So I went to the call. Polytechnique in Grenoble. Then by pure chance, maybe at dinner I will tell you how it happened. There were American girls involved and so on. Uh, and I was a big fan you know, of movies, so somehow I ended coming to Caltech for my PhD. I thought it's in Pasadena next to Hollywood. I'm going to see all these movie stars in there. That's what made the decision. So I came to Caltech and got my PhD to find out that JPL is part of Caltech. And that's how I ended working at JPL, between JPL and Caltech. And, and, and throughout, throughout even your childhood in these years you've been working, would you describe yourself as more of a dreamer or more of a realist? Because here, both of these things seem to have to come into play. You need the physics to get there, but you need the, you need the imagination to picture where you want to go. I mean, no question in our business and in any business of exploration, you really have to dream to do things. And matter of fact, you remind me of one, uh, uh, one of our employees about a couple of years ago, it was a young lady, I asked her, uh, why are you working here at JPL? What do you like about JPL? She said, well, every morning at breakfast I get with my friend and we think what's impossible and we go and do it. <laughs> and, but that's what you need. You need that kind of attitude to do that. I mean, you need to be you know, your feet on the ground. So you need for you older people like me to make sure they are, you know, they, they follow the right, you know, the right thing. But, but in this business, like any exploration, you know, you need to dream, you need to try thoughtfully, you need to take thoughtful risk. Every once in a while you fail. I didn't show you some of the pictures of things where we failed. But the key thing, you want to be able to stand up after a failure, learn from it, and try again. And that happened to every explorer, not only in space, but every exploration you know, requires that kind of attitude. You, I've read some interviews you, you've given where you kind of describe the atmosphere at JPL. And, and you describe it as a sort of, while very serious, also kind of a zany gang. And you've got rock bands and the artists that you were talking about. And you were already laughing. Which is, how, how crazy a bunch of nuts are you at JPL? <laughs> well, it's, I mean, uh, the key thing is considering when you have pressure for doing this kind you know, of work. Of course, we are serious you know, at work, but you need to have the attitude, a philosophical attitude that you have to be optimistic, mm -hmm. you have to enjoy, because all our projects are done by teams of people. There is no single one person which can do all of this. So just to give you an idea, that rover we had at one time, we had a thousand engineers working on it. So people become like family. So we do have parties, we do have events, so we know when to play and we know when to be serious. But you need that kind of environment and atmosphere, uplifting atmosphere, for people to do these kind of things and to achieve those kind of dreams. I could see in the video of the, when, when Curiosity uh, reached Mars, everybody in that room looked young. Um, there are very few women, but there were women there. Wh who's going into this field now? And I put that in light of the fact that you know people making 
the commitment to the STEM uh, education yep. are being sort of lured into uh, finance jobs and high tech jobs, well paying jobs. I'm assuming that it, this is not a very lucrative area to go into. So who chooses to go into it? No, I, th I think it's uh, for some people it's much more lucrative because people sometimes, people who like working at places like Jeff, people have passion about exploration. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, we have now almost one third of our employees are women. Now they are mostly on the younger generation because mm -hmm. as we see more women you know, graduating from engineering schools. And to give you an example, uh, I mean the change, when I went to Caltech, there were no women at Caltech. The same way at Princeton and many other schools. Today, 45% of the students at Caltech are women. And this wow. is a science engineering kind of school. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, you know, uh, a broader range. So there is an expectation that within the next 10 years, I think you are going to be see women as well as men equal numbers doing that. And, and clearly, young people get very inspired with these kind of things. And as I said, you, know, you need to have passion. You don't go to GPL or to NASA, for that matter, to make big money. Yeah. There are other places yeah. you can do that. But you go there because, for me, what's exciting is when I go home, I can tell my family, guess what? We just landed on Mars today. <laughs> or we just got a sample from a comet. Or we just discovered love of the ocean. For me, that's very, that's the satisfaction. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do a quick adjustment on your mic so that you can relax. I was trying, yeah, because I have a little issue with my voice. So you, you, you said in, uh, also in the talk just now, um, we can put, we, we are in a situation where logistically and more than theoretically, we'll, we're on course to where we could put humans on Mars. I'm not necessarily recommending that. So where are you on that? Are you, pa are you passionate about putting humans there, especially since you now put virtual Mars up there, explore without ever leaving Earth? Are you yeah. passionate about putting people there? No, that's a great question because that's a, a debate which happens all the time. First, for scientific exploration, you can do it with a robot. You know, now our robots are becoming so sophisticated and they are basically an extension of us. It's not the robot doing. The robot is our emissary or our ambassador and we can control them. And then you can send for robots. Now. For now. For we now. Can That's true. Yes. That's a good point. There is a, a talk, I think, later. Yes, there is. I'll be that involved can, in that. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and you can send robot to high hazards areas that you will never send a human. But on the other hand, having human explorers as part of our genes, that's something inspirational. Still young people are uh, amazed by astronauts. So it's really a different reason to send a human. It's something that our country ought to discuss and debate outside of the scientific. Is that something our country wants to do? I mean, a great country do great things. And this could be one example that our country will do. And to give you an idea, because people tell us, oh, we have all these problems on Earth. All of NASA budget, everything we do in space, is less than 0.3% of what you pay in taxes of our national budget, 0.3%. So you can be a judge. Is that a good place to invest 0.3% you know, of your taxes? Is, is, I'll let that applause happen. If you want. <laughs> Do you feel that space exploration is on the defensive in that sense? Is on the what? Is on the defensive? No, I wouldn't say that uh, in general, because I interact a lot with, uh, with people on, in Congress. Uh, people do, are excited about exploration, and, and for two reasons. Uh, I see excitement even in the, some of the political mm -hmm. you know, world. One, people see it as inspirational. Mm -hmm. you know, when we landed Curiosity, I mean, it was a very exciting thing for a lot of young people. Just remember the Apollo program. I, I grew up during that time. Mm -hmm. And I got fascinated, so I went into engineering and science. And that changed a lot of people who went into engineering. And that's where a lot of our technological advances happened. The other one is I give them an example of practical benefit. You, all of you have cell phones. I'll be surprised if any of you doesn't have a cell phone. But you probably don't realize every time you make a call, the code on that communication link was developed at JPL a long time ago to communicate with our spacecraft. And then an entrepreneur picked it up and they use it in cell phone. When you came here, I had to use my GPS 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have found the place here. People forget that GPS is run by satellite which are in orbit. And that's what kind of, you think it happens by magic. But in actuality, that's what the space program brought. And look at the change in our you, life. You, you, said, you said that the, the, the central driving question for going into space is to figure out our own stories and our own beginnings. That that's the driving motive. When we went to the moon, the driving motive that excited the public, in addition to the sense of wonder, was the sense of beating the Soviets. Correct. That's, that's gone. Without that driving motive, is the question that you say will drive us enough, do you think, to keep the public involved? Well, I'm hoping that smart people, and you can make your judgment how smart are the people in Washington, uh, that smart people actually based on, the, as I said, the excitement, the inspiration, getting people more interested in technology and engineering and STEM, like you said, and the technological benefit you get, from, that they feel that that's important enough to do that. Now, would that be a driver? I guess we have to make a judgment. People, people will have to. For me, it drives me, but I'm only one vote. You know, so, so that's the kind of thing that I hope people will see as a benefit of exploration. And the other one I want to mention, which is because many people start at GPL and they go in business. But what that creates, it creates that spirit of adventure, that the people that we want to try really tough things, we want to overcome, and that could be important in any venue of life, not only in space exploration, but in everything we do. You sound like a man who has never been bored a day in his oh, life. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Charles Alachi, truly a national treasure. Thank you so much. Thank you.